Good morning, church family. We're glad that you're joining us again today. He is our King, our God, our Savior. So let's come before him right now. Kneel before his throne. Listen to him. Lord, we give you praise and glory. Praise forever to the King of kings, the Lord over all, all creation, everything in the universe bows to you, Lord. Every knee one day will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father, we give you praise. We thank you that right now we can bow our knee to you. And we bow our hearts before you, bend our ears to hear exactly what you want to say to us today. The very word of God, the word from God. We want it, Lord. We want you. In Jesus' name, amen. God is awesome, mighty above all in the universe. He reigns and rules. Let's praise and worship him this morning. Great are you, Lord. Rise. 
Praise the Spirit, three 
stone was moved for good for the Lamb and conquered death and the dead was from the tombs and the angels stood in all for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born and the fear of left the flame now the gospel the truth of
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord of our Jesus Christ be with you all. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become what you wanted us to be. Lord, that you would just be our everything. Or as we just saying, Lord, how we need you. Lord, you're the one that created everything. You're the one that holds our very breath in your hands. Lord, help us to recognize what a, what a privilege, what a wonderful position we find ourselves in as your children. Lord, I pray that the, the noise of the world and our culture and the things that clamor around us, that they would not distract us or take our hearts from you. Lord, that in these challenging times, we would just draw ever closer to you. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful, that you are good. And Lord, that you are coming again. Lord, that there is a day when everyone will worship Jesus. And we just praise you and thank you. Amen. Glad you're here this morning, 11 o'clock. We've got children's ministry and youth and Sunday school, midweek Bible study at 6.30 on Wednesday night. Also, this month's leadership offering is going to be for youth camp scholarships. There's been a lot of movement back and forth, and a little bit is still going on, but Hume Lake is going to open with a number of restrictions. And uh, if you were here on last Saturday, you saw a lot of the kids running around, and a lot of them were coming to help so that we want to give them scholarships. So we're going to use the, the offering for youth camp scholarships. Also, let's plan on doing communion next Sunday. Let's just turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer one more time. Lord, you are so good, so beautiful, so faithful. 
Lord, I thank you that you care so much about how we live, that you've given us just detailed instructions. You've given us, Lord, your timeless truths, things that never change. Lord, I pray that you would hope, open our hearts and minds today, that you would speak deeply into us. Lord, help us to not only hear today, but to, to respond. Lord, to make any corrections or changes we need to make. But Lord, ultimately, may we just draw closer to you. May we be people that are pleasing to you. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you may recall reading John Bunyan's classic allegory, Pilgrim's Progress. That is the number two bestseller, Christian bestseller of all time. Think about that. Other than the Bible, this has sold more copies than anything else in, as far as Christian literature is concerned. And in case you're not familiar, you need a, re a refresher. It's a wonderful allegory about the journey of Christian faith. <clears throat> and in this story, the main character is appropriately named Christian. And as the story begins, he finds himself living in the city of destruction, and he had on his back a a heavy pack that was full of sin and death. In fact, the pack was so heavy that it threatened to sink him into the lowest depths of the earth. And there, weighed down with the burden of his sin and death and living in the city of destruction, Pilgrim Christian heard of the celestial city, a city that was said to be bright and fair. And so he left the city of destruction in search of that fair, lovely celestial city. Now, on the way to that heavenly city, he met an evangelist named Evangel, who directed him to a gate. And when he arrived at that gate, there were two paths. One path went right through the gate, and it led to the celestial city. The other path sort of looped around and circled and led right back into the city of destruction. You've probably already figured it out, but just in case you haven't, what was in view was heaven and hell. And left with that choice, Christian put down his pack of sin and went through the gate on his way to the celestial city and to the Lord. And our text this morning reminds me of Evangel and Pilgrim's Progress. Because just as Evangel led Christian to a path, Likewise, our passage leads us to a path. It directs us to two ways. One way is the way to bliss, blessedness, peace, light. It's the path that leads to God. It's the one that ultimately results in spending eternity in heaven. The other way is the way that leads to death. Now, as we saw last week in Proverbs 21, 21, in much the same way, our text this morning confronts us with two ways. And you've got to understand, there is no third way. I saw this last week. From God's perspective, there are two options in this thing called life. Heaven or hell. Period. Why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 1. And let's just see what we can learn. I actually find this to be quite one of the most, my favorite and most powerful psalms. And despite the, 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 the bluntness of laying out heaven and hell for us, I've, it's extremely encouraging. Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in God's law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Now the theme of our message this morning is found in verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You can quickly see that this psalm is confronting us with two paths. 
or in reality, two choices that we all must make. To say, well, I'm not ready to make that choice or make that decision, God's eyes, that's a choice. Now, you can see that in the first three verses, the psalmist sets forth the way to what I'm calling the celestial city, to heaven. And in verses 4 and 5, he sets forth the way to the city of destruction and death. Now, I want to begin by looking at the word blessed or blessed in verse 1. Now, you need to know that the Hebrew word that is translated as blessed is one of the most difficult words in the Old Testament to translate. It's a word that is known in linguistics as a bivocal. What that means is that it doesn't have just one meaning. It has many meanings. And we don't have a word in English that is its equivalent. There's no word in the English language that comes close to describing what this word means. I think for most of us, uh, blessed or blessed is sort of an unclear word. I mean, every time I turn on a, a, an awards show or I see a sporting event, somebody's talking about, oh, I'm so blessed. There's, there's all this stuff been ascribed to it, right? Now, depending on if you're using NASB, it says blessed, but depending on your translation, because of the confusion and its difficulty to translate, some translators have chosen the word happy. But that seems inadequate to me. So what exactly does God mean when he says a person is blessed? Well, the first meaning of this word describes a, a state of bliss, of enjoyment. It's a, it describes a statement, uh, a state that Bunyan used allegorically as the celestial city, you know, of heaven, of being with God. Now, I did this last week, and I want to do it again. It's critical that we understand, especially when we're in the Old Testament, we understand what Old Testament writers meant by those use, the use of these various words, rather than just sort of, sort of using our 21st century understanding and New Testament and all that and sort of projecting on it. We need to get, go a little bit deeper. Um, and so a veritable textbook example of what it means to be blessed for the Old Testament believer is given us to us in Psalm 144, verse, beginning in verse 12. And you'll see the psalmist spells out exactly what he means when he says someone is blessed. Now again, as I've already kind of alluded, it's going to be defined in typical Old Testament terms. You know, in very earthly material terms. Because that's how they understood it and experienced it. The kingdom of God to be in those kind of terms. Psalm 144, verse 12. Let our sons in their youth be as grown-up plants, you know, mature, strong. And our daughters as corner pillars, you know, cornerstones, fashioned as for a palace. Let our garners be full, furnishing every kind of produce. And our flocks bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. Let our cattle bear without mishap and without loss. Let there be no outcry in our streets. How blessed are the people who are so situated. How blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Now, we can see from reading this portion of Psalm 144 that in the Old Testament, to be blessed is to have children that are born free of congenital defect. It means to have fertility. You know, the, that your crops and your herds are highly fertile. It means having military security with, with no fear of war or being attacked. That's how they understood a state of bliss. Their oxen will pull heavy loads. There's going to be no war, no going into captivity, you know, no cry of distress in their streets. You know, things are going really well. And look what we see. Happy and blessed are the people of whom this is true. Blessed are the people whose God is Yahweh. So here we see clearly what it means in the Old Testament to be blessed. It's defined in material terms. Now, what's interesting is when we get to the New Testament and Jesus' is teaching, the word blessed is deepened and a spiritual dimension is added. 
So what it means to be blessed in the New Testament can be seen in the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter, Matthew chapter 5, which we looked at in great detail a couple years back. And, and I just want to say this up front. Jesus does not deny the material or tangible earthly aspects of blessing. For example, he says in Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the gentle or meek or humble for they shall inherit the earth. And you may recall that that word that's translated there as gentle, meek, meekness is not, you know, you're a, a pushover. Basically, it, it's, it's strength under stress. So this is one example of what it means in the New Testament. Now notice, Jesus is not denying the material, you know, the historical Old Testament understanding of being blessed. It's still there. But he deepens it when he says in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Which leads me to ask, how much better than having fertile sheep and overflowing barns is it to see God? See, it's, it's more than the earth, it's heaven itself. And so being blessed then is to optimize life. It's to experience life. This is very important, and it ties into one of the things we've been learning in our midweek Bible study recently. It's to experience life as God the Creator intended it to be, apart from sin, the fall, and death. See, that's one of the things I've appreciated about our Bible study this year, because we keep seeing that you know, God had this desire, ultimately, to be intimate with his creatures, to have this fellowship, and it's broken. And ever since then, he has been working to get it back and when Jesus comes the second time, everything is going to be. It's like a new Eden. So, it, you know, it's understanding what life God intended it to be, what he wants your life to be, what he wants my life to be. Again, to use Bunyan, it's a celestial city. It's heaven. It's being in a deep personal relationship with the living God. Now, another interesting fact about this word, which I found to be quite surprising, is that the word blessed always refers to the future. See, it's something going before us and, and beyond us. Now, it's not always clear in the Old Testament where that it will be immediate or, you know, later. But here's the thing. In all 17 instances where this word is used in the Old Testament, it refers to to the future. Second, we are told to delight in God's word if we want to live in a way in which he approves of. Look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now the person who meditates on God's word is pictured in verse 2 as being blessed. Well, why would that God say that? Because they have a relationship with him that is based on Submission to his word. And in this law, the man be, being described delights. See, to him, it's not a, a troublesome and unwelcome thing. It's not a set of hard and fast rules. It's just this thing I have to do. It's a joy for him to learn and to do the demands of the law. Well, again, we talked about this last week. It's not okay, I got to get up today and I want to check the box so I'll spend my 20 minutes in devotions or whatever. No, it's like you get up, you're excited to go to God's Word. You're excited to engage and meet with God. And this is not something that you have to do. It's a privilege and blessing. It's something that you get to do and you, you embrace it joyfully. You see, it's so important that we do that. Now, with emphasis, the second part of the verse informs us that it is upon this same law that this person meditates day and night. Now, obviously not an unwholesome absorption with God's word is in view here, but rather a healthy interest in the word and a knowledge of its real content, which continually influences and affects the persons. It's what we've been seeing in our study of the Psalms. We're taking God's word into our heart, and as it comes into our heart, it begins to change us, it begins to shape us. We start to see our world and life from, from God's perspective instead of a worldly one. But there's more to that if we're, uh, to sort of bring together the Old Testament idea and what we know because of, of Christ. We phrase it this way. 
The idea then would be when your mind is resolute, when it's fixed on Christ, you know, when you're focused on him and his word, the enemy has no advantage over you. They're, yeah, they're going to throw all kinds of stuff at you, and the culture will do that. All kinds of things are going to come your way, because, of course, the more you want to live for the Lord, the more stuff's going to come. But when we're focused on the Lord, when we're immersed in the Word, no problem. But here's the thing. When you begin to sort of consider or open your mind, you toy around with ungodly thinking and ungodly things, it's going to transform you. I'm sure many of you remember, and if not on your own, and probably in high school, the classic Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Remember the benign and kindly Dr. Jekyll? Nice guy. But he felt an evil personality within himself. And he began to experiment with it. And first, voluntarily, he, he prepared this magical potion, and he would drink it, and he would release that diabolical force. But then one evening while he sat at his table, having gone through this and done this many times, and he's debating whether or not to drink the magic potion in order to turn into the hideous, monstrous Mr. Hyde, suddenly, to his dismay, without even drinking the potion, he was turning into Mr. Hyde. And by the end of the story, he ends up becoming Mr. Hyde. He can't go back. It's done. Now, third, the idea of being blessed indicates that a person has a relationship here and now with God that is living, it's active, it's dynamic. So, how do you and I be, live in a way that God approves and blesses? And how do we find favor with him? Well, verse 1 states it negatively. Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Put simply, avoid the path that leads to sin and death. Now, I want to point something out to you. This is important. Sinners, the wicked, the ungodly, the scornful, they're all one and the same. Um, these different words are used to describe a person who simply has no thought of God. You know, these people live their lives as though God does not exist and as if God has never spoken. As if there's no written revelation from you, what we're studying, our Bibles. And they are accountable to no one. They can do whatever they want. That's the wicked. That is the sinner, the scornful. They are what one of my friends used to call practical atheists. It isn't that they don't entertain the idea that, you know, there may be a supreme being out there or that there may even be a creator. See, it doesn't even enter into their thinking. It has no practical effect on their daily routine. It doesn't impact their family relationships. You know, it, it, it's just not there. It doesn't impact the way they do business, their social interactions. It has no bearing on them whatsoever. See, God may be something they the idea that they approve or something that, you know, that's a really nice idea. But they're practical atheists. You know, so understand, when the psalmist talks about the wicked, the wicked are those who don't let God enter into their thinking. The word of God, the laws of God are far from them. That's the wicked. Now, by the way, when the psalmist talks about the counsel of the wicked, the path of sinners... And the seed of scoffers, we need to see this. There's a progression. And what we can learn is that there is a process that leads a person into a hardening, into sin. One prominent Old Testament scholar says, counsel refers to a way of thinking, path refers to a way of behaving, and seat refers to belonging or identification. See, there's a progression here. From the way it starts with the way a person thinks to the way they behave until there's an identification. You know, your thinking gets altered. That's why what's going on in our schools today and taking certain stands is so important. Because it begins, and I've, I've talked about this over and over, it's so critical that you and I learn to think biblically and rightly, that we 
take that time to consider what we're being told or what we see. That we spend that time with God so that we get his understanding. But this process that's being described here, it begins with the way a person thinks. And then pretty soon, when that gets challenged or adjusted, it's not long before it comes, it moves all the way through us into the point where we now become identifying with that. We're part of it. See, again, if your mind is open to the ungodly influences around us that would remove God from your heart, if you're open to it, then you begin to embrace that counsel, whether it comes from you know, the, the, the academics with all their political agendas and isms these days, or it comes on a, a more grassroots level where many people seem to get their philosophies and way of thinking, whether it comes from somebody's blog or Facebook, a YouTube video, your friend, some movie that really impacted you, talk show hosts, professional athletes. People do develop their views from these sorts of people. I hear it all the time. Well, Oprah said, okay, yeah, well, you know, her views don't really line up with Scripture, right? You understand that? But people get this stuff, and with the Internet and the things that are out there, oh, I saw this or I saw that. Oh, I read it in the paper. You know, these days that doesn't mean much, sadly. <clears throat> but understand what the psalmist is saying. It begins with counsel, thinking. Then it moves to the realm of behavior. And finally, it moves you to the point that you actually belong there. You've become part of it. Now, I, I kind of touched on this last week. My observation... I know there's exceptions. My observation is that most people don't begin wicked and evil. They have to be led into that state where they end up sitting in the seat of scorn, the scornful. Again, that's why we have to guard our minds. We have to guard our hearts. Or the warning is you may actually become someone or something that you once disdained or despised. So, this is probably the, one of the most important things I can point out today. I just want you to see this. The psalmist is telling us a basic truth, a fundamental truth, a cornerstone for the Christian's life. Your mind must be fixed on God and his word so that you don't get caught up in wicked ways to get off track. Alexander Pope captured this truth in his famous poem, Vices, although I have a feeling that poem would, would get blocked these days. Vices among us so frightfully mean as to be hated, but to be seen. Be seen too often, become too familiar, that face we must, first endure, then pity, then embrace. Don't want to be insensitive to anybody, but we're going to stand on God's word. I want you to think about what has happened regarding issues of sexuality and gender in North America these past 40 years. This confusion. 40 years ago, you couldn't talk about these things. It was a monster so frightfully mean as to be hated, but to be seen. Everyone knew that. But we tolerated it. We looked at it too long. We ended up being open to it. Vices among us so frightfully mean as to be hated needs to be seen, but seen too often, too familiar, that face we must endure, then pity, then embrace. We endured it. We pitied it as, a, as a, some sort of sickness or illness, and now we embrace it as a society. Right now, if you're not paying attention, you and I are no longer to use the word he or she. That's offensive. That's wrong. You're a bad person. You're one of those if you use he or she. Saw a thing a couple weeks ago. There are now a hundred genders. Really? God said there were two. This is what's happened. It's what we became. I look at verse 2 again. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh. 
and his, in his law he meditates day and night. See, a basic truth is that your mind must be fixed on God and his word so that things like I just described cannot happen to you. When you start entertaining all these different ideologies and ideas without praying, without thinking, without checking them against the word of God, it's easy to get deceived. I've, I've talked to Christians that somehow have been sort of deceived into thinking that, well, they need to go ask forgiveness for things that their forefathers did 500 years ago. It's, it's craziness. It's not biblical. See, above all things, you need to guard your mind and keep it fixed on Christ and his holiness. You know, I always find there's much to learn from history. And the ancient Greeks understood the need to guard their hearts and minds. You can see that demonstrated in the myth of the Medusa. You know that one, the Medusa? This uh, woman, she had like snakes for hair and a hideous face. Just, ooh. And the myth was that if you looked at the face of the Medusa, your heart would turn to stone. Folks, that was profound truth. Because what the myth taught was that you cannot look at evil just straight on, full force, without having it affect you. I used to do research for a, a professor when I was on staff at Western, and there were certain kinds in the occult and things that he only let me look at so much because he says, I'm sorry, but even as my assistant and as a Christian, if you keep looking at this too long, it's going to affect your heart. Dangerous. And ultimately, my friend, who was very involved in deliverance ministries and things in the right way, eventually had to stop because it had too great a toll on his heart and mind. Let's apply that to today. You cannot read certain literature. You cannot watch violence and sex on television, on the internet, or in video games and not have it impact your heart. It will do it. And it begins with the way of thinking. Entertaining certain thoughts, you know, listening and hearing until you become part of it. And then you belong to it. You identify with that very thing that, as I said earlier, you probably once disapproved of. Kenneth Boa had a great insight. He said, compromise destroys us a little at a time, gradually eroding the ground beneath our feet until we find ourselves in a full-on freefall. So again, above all things, guard your mind. Guard your heart. In reality, the psalmist asks us, where's your mind? And what are you thinking about? What are you focusing on? Where's your heart? Where are your affections, your loves? They must be on Holy Scripture because that's where we meet God and come to know him. And third, verse 3 tells us the result of living of a God-approved life. I want you to see the beautiful imagery here. This person will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. See, there's always refreshment and nourishment right there, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Now, this phrase, its fruit in season, emphasizes both the distinctiveness and the quiet growth of the product. So understand, the tree isn't simply sort of a, a channel that pipes water unchanged from one place to another. No, it's a living organism which absorbs it. It takes it in. So in due course, it will produce something new and delightful, proper to its kind and its time. Now let me just point out that the promised immunity of the leaf from withering is not independent of the rhythm of the seasons. What I'm saying is, the, the picture here is not what, you know, every fall, one of the things that happens, and many of us don't like it, is all the leaves come off our trees and we got to rake them, right? He's not saying, yeah, the leaves are never coming off the trees again. That's, that's not the point. The point of the illustration is that the leaf is free from the crippling damage of drought. And this also is what it means to be blessed. Now, in contrast, let's look more closely at the way of the life a way of life that God disapproves of. And we've already seen that two characteristics of those whom God disapproved was their coarse character filled with wickedness, all these things we've seen, the scoffing and that. 
Look at verse 4. So he's contrasting the righteous and the wicked. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Now, this one kind of intrigued me. Because the psalmist could have contrasted verse 3 with verse 4 by describing, you know, a, a scrawny, crippled little tree that in every way was the opposite of the one that he just pictured in verse 3. Instead, a stronger contrast was made by selecting the most useless of the elements to be found in the vegetable world, and generally known in ancient times as chaff. Chaff is the ultimate in what is rootless and weightless and useless. And the illustration here is that of winnowing, in which what they would do is you'd have the, the grain in the pile there, and you'd take sort of a, a pitchfork, and you'd throw it in and throw it up in the air. The, the grain, which was heavier, would, would fall but the chaff, which is useless, just blows away. It's gone. See, chaff is the ultimate in what's rootless, weightless, and useless. Now, just by the way, there is only one use for chaff. You burn it. So what's the point? What are we being told? In their pride, the wicked don't see God, nor is there room in their thoughts for God. You know, there, and here's the thing, and this is the one I think makes you and some of us really struggle in our times, especially these days. This is a hard one for us, maybe not you, hard for me to wrap my mind around this one sometimes. The ways of the wicked may for now be prosperous. Because you can be wicked and doing well in the present. But here's what you have to keep in mind. This is what I keep telling myself. <laughs> They're prospering without any regard for God. Their kingdom is here and now, and there is no celestial city in their future. There is no heaven. They don't believe it. They are haughty and proud, and God's laws, his word, is far from them. They sneer at God. They sneer at Christians. They sneer at their enemies. They could not care less about the word of God or the law of God or the very things we are studying this morning. And I want to be very clear about this because sometimes this is a tough one for us too, but it's what God says and his word says. They live in a way that God hates. Hates. And disapproves of. And you can see in verse 6 the ultimate result of living in that way. But the way of the wicked will perish. You see, as we saw last week, God is not going to be mocked. You are going to sow, you know, what you sow is what you're going to reap. I know sometimes we get frustrated by the things we're seeing and the things that are going on. It seems to be at a heightened pace right now, and I get that. I, honestly, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm just trying not to, to get myself bogged down like I told you last week. But you've got to understand, God will justly judge the wicked for their behavior. The day's coming. You know, Doug prayed that at the beginning today. The day is coming, and God... May it come soon. When every knee, willing or unwilling, is going to bow at the name of Jesus Christ. So people may think they're getting away with stuff. You and I shouldn't buy into that. That's a myth. That's a lie. Nobody gets away with anything. But God and his grace and his wisdom. And the other thing we've got to understand, some of those people well, are going to be brothers and sisters of ours, of ours someday too. Because that's the kind of God we have. But well, my friends, we all have to make a choice. This is where we connect to last week. And you've got to understand, no matter what this world tells us, no matter what we may tell ourselves, God tells us very plainly, there are only two options. Heaven and hell. So when you... If you honestly look at your life right now, what do you see? 
What path are you following? The path that leads to eternal life or the path that's going to lead to eternal separation? You know, one of my favorite pieces of art is a, is a woodcut by the famous Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer. Phenomenal piece of art. His, his work is amazing. So much so that here we are, what, more than 500 years later, you can still, you go to the, the Met and any of the major museums, you can buy copies of this piece of art. And in this particular piece of art of which I speak, he portrays a knight of noble bearing who's riding on this beautiful white stallion. And they're going, down together, going together down a pathway. And beside them, the way is surrounded by these large Lombardy poplar trees. It's night, and, and the moon is shining through the trees, and it just illumines the night on this white stallion. But down along on the path, in the dark resources, is the devil, demons, monsters, and just these awful, hideous creatures. And they're all reaching up, trying to pull the knight down off the stallion into their denizens of darkness. And if you've never seen it, when you look at it the first time, there are so many of them that you fear for the night. I mean, just for me, it just evokes this response. You're like, (gasps) and you're afraid he's never going to make it. Until you look for a second time. And then you realize that the night, he isn't even looking at him. His eyes are fixed on a mountain in the distance. And on the top of that mountain, there's a castle. And his eyes are fixed on his castle home. And then you realize what the artist is saying. He's saying these monsters, the devil, these hideous creatures have no advantage over that night so long as his mind is fixed on his heavenly home. That is the point of the art, that is the point of the metaphor, and that's the point of Psalm 1. Your mind must be fixed on God and his word or else you will be pulled down into the darkness. So you know, I have to ask, where and what are your eyes fixed on this morning? The celestial city, you know, heaven and God, or the city of destruction? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being so straightforward and gracious. Lord, you're constantly warning us. You're always trying to help us to live in a way that not only is pleasing to you, Lord, but it's, it's good. It's edifying. Lord, it seems like there's so many forces at work trying to derail us, trying to entice us, to get us to take our eyes off of you, to question your character, to, to question the veracity of your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be strong, that we could be like that tree that's pictured in this psalm, Lord, that's just got that constant source of refreshment, of nourishment, of food. May that be what you are to us, Lord. Lord, help us to take our thoughts captive, not to the ideologies and things of this world, but to obedience to your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would guard us, that you would strengthen us, that you would help us to move forward in you today so that we might be a light, Lord, that we might be a strength, a hope, a place where others can come and find out the reason for the hope that we have in you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for. Yeah.
Wednesday for Bible study. Have a great week in the Lord. God bless.